Speaking, communicating, charisma, the stage effect. It's one of the oldest topics that existed in the world. How many people can you meet in a day? The biggest impact I can have is physically meeting people. The principle applies to all personal contact, not just one-on-one, -on -one, but it applies one-on-five, and it applies one-on-ten, and one-on-a-hundred, and one-on-a-thousand, and one-on-ten-thousand. And not only does it apply in each of those situations, but it's magnified. It's actually magnified. The more people that are in the audience, the more influence you have on the individual people that are in the audience. It's a strange thing. We call it the stage effect. Good morning. After Gotham's speech, I just, I'm feeling like Kool-Aid. Anybody want some Kool-Aid? <laughs> All right, all right. I, I am very excited about this. I love Mind Valley University and I love Tallinn. And this morning, how many of you guys saw me yesterday with, with our family dog? Didn't you? I was out with the dog, Freddie. And this morning again, I went out with Freddie and I'm, I'm walking along and I see people with their bracelets and I can say hi to them out on the street because we've taken over Tallinn. Have we taken over? Yes! And so I'm walking along and then I see this, this dog coming along off the leash, which is not so usual, but it's off the leash and it comes running up to talk to Freddie. You know, like dogs talk to each other. Lots of sniffing and stuff. And, and, and then the dog starts barking. But, but it can't. Have you ever seen this? Like, it, it, a dog had laryngitis. It was like, <laughs> and I, like, I've never seen it. And I'm starting to think, oh, no, Freddy, I don't want Freddie to catch this, whatever this is. A dog's got doggy COVID. What's wrong with this dog? And, I, and, I, and, and then the couple comes up, and, and I'm, I, I, I'm like, hey, what's, what's going on with your dog? Is it okay? You know, if, and, and the woman says, we had him debarked. <laughs> what? You, what? You had him debarked? Now, I don't say it like that. I'm not, I'm like, oh, really? Uh, what exactly does that mean? And she goes, well, he was just out of control. He's just barking all the time, and we couldn't stop him. So we, there's a procedure, and we just had it taken out. We had the bark box taken out, and, and he can't bark anymore, and it's perfect. And I'm like, I don't want to get into a conflict with these people. And besides, there's nothing we can do. We can't rebark the dog. So there's no point in getting into a car. But I do turn to the husband and go, and you were okay with this? And he said, I didn't have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Speaking, communicating, charisma, the stage effect. I. This is one of the most exciting topics that exists in the world. And one of the reasons is it's one of the oldest topics that existed in the world. Your brain evolved over millions of years, and long before you had a device to store things in, your memories and your phone numbers and such, long before you had that, your brain had to figure out how to assimilate information. It had to figure out how to take the information in and store it. And the trouble is, is that there's so much information around all the time. I mean, all the time there's information coming in, and you can't store all of it. So your brain has to try to figure out what to store and what to release. How many of you have found that currently your brain stores things you don't want it to and releases things that you wish it wouldn't? Anybody found a bit of that? Yeah. And, and that's because our world is different today than when our brains evolved. It's very different today. And, and, and there's a huge clue. The way your brain decides what to store and what to release is based on emotional response. So if you have almost no emotional response, say for example to where you left your keys, then you won't remember where you left your keys because there's no emotional response to that. And, and so when you do have an emotional response, your brain goes, oh, I had an emotional response. This information must be important. And it stores it. Does this make sense? And, 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 and so, for millions of years, you know, humans have had fire for about two million years. Two million years. And the predominant method of sharing information, the predominant message, uh, method of sharing wisdom was sitting around fires telling stories. And so our brains are very good at that. Our brains really like stories. And not only do they like stories, but our brains really like storytellers. In fact, I, I want you to think about this for a moment. Imagine that it's 30,000 years ago, and you're sitting around the fire, and somebody shares a story 
about how they walked around a corner and they saw a lion. And I, I don't know, I, I've actually had this experience a number of times, really, truly. I actually walked into a riverbed once and there were 14 lions, 14. And, and when, you, when that happens to you, there's some chemical changes that happen inside. <laughs> the heart starts racing and all this stuff is going on. But imagine you're sitting around the fire and the person telling a story says, and this is what I did. And because I did that, I'm still alive. Are you gonna remember this story? You are, but imagine a week later, you walk around a corner and you see a lion. And then the story comes flooding back into your head, right? And you do the things that that storyteller told you to do and you survive. For the rest of your life, when you have a choice of whose fire to sit around, whose fire are you sitting around? His fire. We have been attracted to the storytellers of our community for millions of years because they were saving our life and they were making us more successful. They were making us better hunters. They're making us better gatherers. They're making us better people. And that was the main system of education, the main system of memory, the main system of passing on generational wisdom. Our brains are very good at it. And so that's why today, in all the methods of marketing that are out there, there's all these methods of marketing, and they're all effective in different ways, and they now all can be measured in different ways. But if you measure all the methods of marketing by one metric, and that is memorability, by just one metric, memorability, then nothing creates a deeper memory than a powerful personal interaction, face-to-face, -face, nothing. You can run your ad during friends reruns for a month and it won't have the same impact as actually having an emotional connection with somebody. Are you with me? Yes. And that is one of the most powerful things you could ever understand about business, about influence, about your social project that you want to get out into the world, except for one problem, and that is how many people can you meet in a day? I remember when I first learned this, I was in business and I was like, what, the, the biggest impact I can have is physically meeting people? I lived in England at the time. And, 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 and I, so if I wanted to drive to people, it was an hour to drive somewhere, an hour to drive to Birmingham, two hours to drive to London. How many meetings could I have in a day? Three? But then I discovered something else, that the principle applies to all personal contact, not just one-on-one, -on -one, but it applies one-on-five. And it applies one-on-ten, and one-on-a-hundred, and one-on-a-thousand, and one-on-ten-thousand. And not only does it apply in each of those situations, but it's magnified. It's actually magnified. The more people that are in the audience, the more influence you have on the individual people that are in the audience. It's a strange thing. We call it the stage effect. It's an unnatural magnetic attraction that somebody creates when they stand on stage, they put themselves at risk, and they share engaging valuable content. And, and it's, it's, it, it is one of the most powerful things you could ever learn to take advantage of, except for one problem, and that is that prior to Mind Valley University, many of you went to other universities or other schools, and in those schools, what they taught you was public speaking is a terrifying undertaking. Is this true? Yeah. Right? They taught you that. And, 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 and so they took away one of the most powerful tools you could ever have for making your life amazing by making us afraid of it. The stage effect is so, so powerful, and there's lots of reasons for it, but I want to give you a little formula. The formula kind of works like this. The stage effect is, is the result of the quality of your presentation times the number of people that are watching your presentation. And that's changed as well, because now it counts for views. Come on, doesn't it? You, you, somebody sends you a video and it's had 23 views. Are you watching it? Depends on who sent it to you, right? If it was a very good friend and it had 27 views, all right. But if it was not a very good friend and it had 27 views in the bin, yes? But what if it had 27 million views? I might watch that. You see, and, and it might cause you to be more engaged in it. And how about this? When there's a lineup outside the nightclub, have you seen that? Lineup outside the nightclub, suddenly you're like, what's going on in there? I remember being in London once, friends of mine wanted to go to this cool nightclub, and we got into the line, and we're in 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 the line, I hate lines. We're in the line, and then finally they let the line go into the club. We got into the club, nobody in there. 
Smart, because if we had just walked in and there'd be nobody there, we would have left. Now, the line attracted people, right? And, and, and then when we walked in, we'd been committed for half an hour in the line. We weren't gonna just turn around and walk out. Smart marketing. I was walking in the streets of Amsterdam some years ago, and uh, you notice Amsterdam, there's a lot of, I don't know why, but there's a lot of like munchy junk food around. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Uh, there's, there's lots of sugary stuff and lots of greasy, salty stuff. It's like, it's, it's like the people in Amsterdam have odd cravings for some reason. <laughs> but there's chippies on every corner, little chip places everywhere. And, and with mayonnaise and cheese, I don't know what's going on over there. But here's what's really interesting. I'm walking along and there's a chippy place right beside me. I am not incredibly tempted to go into the chippy place. But across the way, there's another chippy place. Fritz, they call them. And I look over at the Fritz place, and there's about 70 people in the line. And there's a sign that says, World's Best Fritz. Now, there's a Fritz place here, and there's a Fritz place on every corner in Amsterdam, but this one has 70 people, and suddenly I really want to try these Fritz. <laughs> like, there's something about an audience. Are you with me? So the stage effect has everything to do with the exposure you're getting, that is to say, the number of people in your audience or the number of people that are watching your videos and the quality of the presentation. And the downside of that, of course, is, is that if you give a really bad presentation for a large number of people, it backfires, right? It's the opposite number. But when you even give a moderate presentation in front of an audience, you create the stage effect. And I'm gonna give you some metrics for this. Um, I want you to imagine that you have, uh, there are two Eric's, and one is terrified of public speaking and networking and all that kind of stuff and doesn't, doesn't like doing it, and the other one does. And they both go to a business conference. And the one who's afraid of public speaking goes out and he meets lots of people, exchanges business cards, does his elevator pitch to meet as many people as he can. And the other one calls the organizers and says, hey, I'd like to do a 30-minute keynote and I'm gonna give this much value and I'd like to do that at the conference, please, and gets booked. Now, at the end of the whole conference, Who's going to have met more people? The one on stage. The one on stage is gonna meet more people because right now I'm meeting, I don't know how many hundreds of you at once. And I can tell you that if I didn't come into this, if you didn't know who I was and I tried to meet all of you the normal way, it would take ages to meet you and most of you wouldn't remember me anyway because you've met tons of other people. Does it make sense? A week later, I'm calling you. Hey, uh, you remember we met at the, at the conference? No. Yeah, we were at the Starbucks, remember? And we talked and I gave you, no. You wouldn't remember that one. But imagine that the Eric who was on stage called you. Would you remember him? What we, like, hi, it's Eric. What? What's going on here? Right? The memory is much more powerful. Now, how about this? Let's say they're both business consultants. Which one are you more interested in hiring? Why? Because of the stage effect. Because the minute somebody stands on stage, the minute somebody stands in front of a camera and speaks confidently, congruently, and adds value to your life, they create credits with you. And, and that, that person suddenly becomes the one you want to hire. And not only is it somebody you want to hire, but it's somebody you will pay significantly more to do business with. I, I got off stage, I was speaking at a conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. It was with Tony Robbins. And I did a talk for about two hours, and it was super fun. I had lots of high energy, they were great, it was awesome. And then these guys came up to me, you know, the line of people, people who want selfies and autographs and all this stuff, and these two guys came up to me, and they go, can we buy you lunch? Now, I know what that means. That means that they want something, doesn't it? They want something. So they go, can we buy you lunch? I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. They seemed like good guys. I went and had lunch with them. And they were running a website that had 110 million visitors a year, all American. It was a purely American website, 110 million visitors a year. Phenomenal. And they're like, you need to come work for us. And I'm like, no, I really don't. I, I, <laughs> I, I live in the Caribbean, you're in California, I'm not moving to California, not happening, I love where I am. And they go, no, 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 you gotta come work for us. I go, I, guys, I'm not coming to work for you. Now, I am not interviewing for a job, you understand. I just finished on stage and I'm getting a free lunch. <laughs> They're trying to offer me a job. So I start finding out a little bit more about their business and it's pretty interesting and, and they own lots of really cool domains and they wanna have a big impact on the world. And, and so in the end I say, 
look, guys, I, I wouldn't mind maybe one day coming and I can spend a week with you and do a brainstorming session and we can do some, some work that way, but that's it. And they go, well, what if you did that every month? <laughs> like, you want me to fly to San Diego every month for a week? I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. And they go, well, what would your rate for that be? You hear they're not hearing the no, are they? <laughs> like, they're just not hearing the no. And one of the things I've learned is that one of the best ways to say no is to raise your price. It's a great way to, when you're ready to say no, you just raise your price. So I did that. I said, well, they said, you know, what, what would the price for this be? And this is uh, 15 years ago. And so 15 years ago, I raised the price. I said, oh, my, 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 my consulting fee for the week would be $30,000. And I don't work Mondays and Fridays. I, <laughs> I fly. I, fl I, have a, I have family. I have to fly on the Monday and fly on the Friday. So for three days, $30,000. That was me saying no. And they said, yes. <laughs> and I guarantee you, had I showed up at their office the week before, knocked on the door and said, can I please have a job? They're like, no. <laughs> but now that I've been on stage, and I made them laugh, and I made them think, and I added value, everything changed. Does this make sense? All right, now, here's the, here's the, here's the tough part, though. Some of you are thinking, yeah, but you're Eric. <laughs> right? That's what you're thinking. Yeah, but you're Eric. No, no. You know, hang on a second. Who do you think Simon Sinek was before he was Simon Sinek? Okay, he was probably still Simon Sinek, but, <laughs> but he was Simon Sinek with a couple less zeros on his keynote fee. Do you understand? He was going out, his keynote fee was about $30,000, and then he did a TEDx talk, and it went off to get millions of views, and it launched him in the most incredible way. Before that, he was just Simon. What about Brené Brown? Brené Brown, phenomenal social scientist, right? Giving great information, talking about the science of vulnerability, only without any vulnerability of any kind, and so nobody had ever heard of her. Yeah, you know, nobody had really ever heard of her. And then, you know, I mean, they had in the professional circles, which is great. You know, it was good professional recognition, but it wasn't commercial recognition. And then one day, she got invited to do a TEDx talk. And she decided to change something with that TEDx, TEDx talk. She didn't just talk about vulnerability. She spoke with vulnerability. And the audience loved it. And then she got home. She got home, and, and, and she saw that the video got like 600 views. She's like, whoa, take that down. I, I shared some stuff I don't necessarily want out there. Then it was 6,000 views. She's calling, can you take the video down? Six million views, four New York Times bestsellers. And, and I remember years ago, just at the beginning of this, I was helping organize a conference in Copenhagen. And we contacted Brené Brown's team. We got the dates cleared. She was available. Everything was good. Then we found out her fee. It was only $30,000, which I, I know that only $30,000 doesn't sound right. It seems like a lot of money for an hour and a half, don't you think? Seems like that. But, you know, she was available. It was 30000 We had the money. We booked, we, we, we contacted her to agree the 30000 And then she responded, no, I'd rather spend that weekend with my family. How many of you would like to just casually turn down $30,000? Anyone? <laughs> casually turn it down. One talk, one well-constructed, well-delivered talk, can change your entire life. And that's because of the sage effect. It's because of the evolutionary relationship we have with stories. One well-constructed, one well-delivered talk can change your entire life. You are one talk away from something amazing. How many of you guys would like to have a great like, best-selling book? Who'd like to have that? One talk away. Who would like to sell a TV series, a documentary, movie or something? One talk away. Who wants to raise a bunch of money for a, a, a new business or something? One talk. One well-constructed talk away. And you know what's crazy is some of you feel like that's just not you. Right? It's just not you. You don't have that. This is something people are born with. I have good news and I have bad news for you. The good news is, no, I'm going to start with the bad news. Should we start with the bad news? The bad news is it is something you're born with. So. Okay, I'm done. The good news is that you were born with it. Every one of you. I know, I know some of you are on, yeah, everybody but me. 
Like you're thinking it's not you, but you were, you were born with it. And I can prove this to you. How many of you have ever been on a plane with a two-year-old that was afraid of public speaking? <laughs> no. They're never afraid of public speaking. That happens to them after that, probably because of that flight. <laughs> That's where they first started learning it. But the truth is, every one of you, and I, wanna, I want you to get something so powerful. I want you to understand this. If you would like to become a world-class golfer, and I'm choosing golf instead of tennis, because for most of you, it's too late for tennis. <laughs> right? I mean, look, I remember three years ago, it was like, Roger Federer is getting so old now. He's so old. He was 34 when I heard that. <laughs> so I found that a little soul-destroying, really. But the, I'm using golf because you could, you could potentially go play on the Senior Pure. You could. So what would have to happen for you to do that? What are some of the things you'd have to do? Practice. Lots of practice. You need your Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours, right? You'd have to get yourself a good coach. You'd have to watch lots of videos, and then you'd have to hit a million balls. Andre Agassi's father said anybody who hits a million balls by the time they're 16 is going to be world number one in tennis. So if you use the same principle in golf, you'd have to go hit a million balls. And it would take you years and years and years. And the reason is that golf is not natural. It's not something that was innately born in you. I think it was a sport invented by Scottish parents who were trying to get rid of their children. <laughs> Here, go hit this ball into that hole 18 times and then come back. It's not, it wasn't born, you know, it wasn't, but, but communicating, public speaking, that's already inside you. That's in you right now. It always was. In fact, you even know that. You have a little voice going, no, you know it's true. Like, you know that it is. You know that there are times when you walk away from a conversation, you say, I wish I, I, wish I would have said this. That's that inner you who wants to communicate effectively. But the trouble is, is that somewhere along the line, people helped you become less comfortable with it. And the good news about it is, is that it can be turned on in a moment. So let me just back up for a moment. Do you agree with me that when somebody stands on the stage and they create value, they engage you, they entertain you, and they, they educate you, they inspire you, that that person creates an unnatural magnetic attraction that makes you want to follow them, do business with them, invest with them? Is that true? Yes. Let's, let's really, is it really true? Yes. Okay. So if that's true, how many of you would like to be able to do that more to make your business work, your project work, your social projects work? How many of you would like to become infinitely more powerful as a communicator? Okay, good, you're in the right room. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Now here's the challenge though. You all exist on a spectrum and it is a spectrum of comfort with public speaking. So there are some of you in this room right now that are completely confident and completely comfortable with public speaking. I could, uh, oh, look at that, I have a microphone. I could walk out into the audience with this microphone and I could offer it to you. Now, some of you are looking at that microphone like, like, please don't. I know, some of you, some of you, if I walk too close, look, you can even see, look, let's see. Oh. <laughs> Eyebrow raise, like, you see what's going on? There's, it's a terrifying thing. But some of you are excited about it. Some of you are terrified and some of you are excited. And, and in the middle of all this is a word invented by the phenomenal Kirsty. She invented this word. It's called scariosity. <laughs> Scary, by the way, as soon as she said it, I registered scariosity.com. <laughs> I own it. And this is what it means. It means that you have enough curiosity that you want to do it, but you're also scared. Scur scariosity. How many of you have scariosity? Okay, now let's find out where you are on the scariosity spectrum. I want to know who here is unreservedly willing and excited to, to speak anytime right now. If I told you you got to come 15 minutes, you would do it. Yeah. Check it out. Now I will tell you, you are in unique company. I've never had that many hands raised for this number of people. No, I'm serious. You're in unique company. You are well done to everybody who raised their hands. Well done, give them a hand. Of course, like 80% of them might have been students of mine, but that's a whole different, <laughs> that's a different situation. So now, let's, at the level below that, there are some of you who are like, not quite there, but if I told you that you could come and do 15 minutes on the stage tomorrow, 
that you'd, you'd, you wouldn't probably sleep much tonight. You'd be kind of weird, like scariosity, nervous, excited, but ultimately you would want to do it and you'd be happy to do it. Where are you? Who's in that category? Look at that. Looks like about half. Again, very solid, very solid. And now there's another level of you that are below that level where it's like, if we asked you to do it, you would immediately find your mouth drying up, your stomach beginning to twist a little. You might still be tempted to do it, but you, you would be feeling a bit nauseous. You would be, it wouldn't be, you're, you're a little off. Who's in that category? All right. Now there's another category, and that's like, hell no. I am not doing that. That is just like, no. I am terrified of it. I don't want to speak. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Who's in that category? Look around, guys. Look around. Look, look, I just need to see where they are. Okay, excellent, because I might need to talk to them later. <laughs> All right. And now there's another category. And these are the people who heard that last question and did not raise their hands. <laughs> because they were certain I was looking for them. And now they're going to come to the terrible realization that I have already figured out who they are. Some of them are sitting lower in their seats now, wishing they weren't here. Oh, I should have been to that other session. All right. Now, the reason I want to talk a little bit about this is that the toughest fears to deal with are the fears that are based in reality, and the easiest fears to deal with are the ones that are completely rational. So if you have a balloon phobia, which is incidentally, I think, called glossophobia, or globophobia, that's more, globophobia. If you have a balloon phobia, it's an irrational phobia. There's no need to be afraid of balloons. I'll tell you exactly what happened to you. You were about two years old. You went to a party. Somebody put a balloon in your face, and it popped. And that was the beginning. But then what happened was your parents, in their ever so sweet desire to protect you, started keeping you away from balloons at this point. And, and they would, when you got invited to parties, they would go, oh, um, little Jimmy wants to come to the party, but are there going to be balloons there? <laughs> and they started protecting you from balloons. And if they did that really effectively, you're now 45 years old and terrified of balloons, and you have a phobia. But it's irrational, and it can be dealt with in seconds. Any good neurolinguistics person, any good coach, any good psychotherapist, any good hypnotherapist can deal with that very, very easily. The, 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 the fears that are a little harder to deal with and equally can be dealt with quite rapidly, the ones that are a little harder to deal with are the ones that are based in reality. So if you have a fear of snakes, you know, if you have a fear of snakes, there's a reality in that. I, I was doing some wildlife photography just south of Botswana once, and I'm in this river. It's a small river. I'm in the water, and I'm taking pictures of fish through the water. And then the guide that I'm with, Linda, she says, you know, the snakes here just love the water. Like, this is where they all are. You really want to be in the water like that. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. And she goes, do you really know snakes? And I go, I feel pretty good about them. And so we got back to camp, and she showed me a picture of a snake. And she said, is it venomous? I said, yes, I know that one. It's venomous. Then she showed me another one. Is it venomous? I go, yep. And she showed me three or four. Yep, yep. She showed me a bunch. And then she showed me another one and said, is it venomous? I go, yep. And she goes, no, it isn't. And I go, yeah, but if I think they all are, I'll be all right. <laughs> I, got, I got it under control. She said, OK, good system. Good system, but the truth is, there's a benefit in being afraid of snakes. There's a benefit in being afraid of spiders. I mean, you don't need to be phobic of them, but that's the trouble is when you take a rational fear and you add an irrational fear to it, then you know, you've got a problem. And that's what public speaking fear is. You see, one of the reasons that you have a fear of public speaking is that on some level, what you're actually afraid of is ostracization. You're afraid of being kicked out of the cult. You're afraid of being kicked out of the family or what have you. It's not real. It's not really going to happen to you. But on some level, for a long time, if you misspoke, if you said the wrong things, then you could create that kind of break in your social connections. That's the rational part. The irrational part is everything else that happened after that. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, in school, this is a very important parenting thing that we're going to talk about right now. I want you to hear me about this. And I don't consider myself to be any great parenting expert, but I do have a 25-year-old son and a 5-year-old girl, and now I have two teenage stepdaughters. And so I think I have a perspective on parenting that most people don't ever get to have. Raise one fully and start again. Fascinating experience. So I want to share something with you about this with parenting. Here, here's a very important understanding. Children don't understand sarcasm. They don't understand sarcasm, and they don't understand your adult jokes and your adult humor. They don't understand your adult lessons. They will begin to in time, but initially they won't. Children are very literal. 
So when you say something to them, they take it quite literally. I'll give you an example. I, I had terrible self-esteem issues as a child. This is how that happens. My father looks like, you know, Paul Newman. He, you know, he's got the, the, the nice light hair and the icy eyes and all that. And my brother looks like him. So they've got that sort of Paul Newman, Brad Pitt thing going on over there. And then there's this. Then there's this. And so my brother, my dad, would take us out and introduce us to people. And in an ironic sort of twisted humor joke, he would introduce us and go, this is my son, Eric, and this is my son, Nick, the good looking one. It was meant humorously. Every adult understood he was just self-congratulating himself. That's it. Every, every adult knew it was a joke. But the one person who didn't know it was a joke was me. It was my father. I mean, he wouldn't tell, he wouldn't lie. It's the truth. Children don't understand sarcasm, and children don't understand your adult lessons. So if school teachers understood this a little better sometimes, most of us wouldn't be so afraid of public speaking, because here's how it works. If you are teaching, if you are a school teacher, how many school teachers do I have here? Okay, please, I, I'm, I'll bet you guys already know this, because you're in this audience, I'll bet. But if you're a school teacher, when you ask, having done a huge lecture on the War of 1812, and you ask, what was the captain's name who, who, who stopped the American invasion of Canada? What was the captain's name? And you ask everybody to raise their hands. What are you really looking for? You're not looking for the kids who raised their hands. You're looking for the ones who didn't. Do you understand? You're looking for the ones who didn't raise their hand because what you're seeing is that if you got 90% hand raises, you've done a great job, the lesson is in there. But if you only got 10% hand raises, something's not right and the, either the kids aren't paying attention or you haven't taught them effectively. Does this make sense? Now, what if you've got a child? I mean, I don't know if any of you were like this. I'm sure not. But every now and again, there was a child who like was looking out the window, uh, not paying attention, dreamy. Anybody know children like that? Yeah, they, they, they now call this um, attention deficit disorder. I frankly call it boring teacher syndrome. Uh, you know, you don't have that here at Mind Valley University, luckily, but, but I, I definitely was like that as a, as a kid. And so I, I would sit at my desk and I would hear the lesson the first time and I would get it. And then they would have to teach it again. And then they would have to teach it and they have to do that. They can't, they can't just move at the pace of the students who got that lesson the quickest. They got to do that. But when they're teaching it for the second and third and fourth time, what's going on in my brain? I, I, yeah, like Star Wars themes. I don't know. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm doodling. I'm not paying any attention. And, and so then that means I'm not hearing what's going on. And the teacher is going to want to teach me an important lesson. And the lesson the teacher wants to teach me is pay attention to my class. And how is the teacher going to teach me that lesson? The teacher's going to do a huge lecture on 1812, the War of 1812. Captain Brock, Captain Brock writes to the king and he says to the king, I want to come and fight Napoleon. And the king says, no, no, I need you to stay there and protect Canada. Oh, no, I don't trust these Americans. And he's like, I got to say, and, and Captain Brock, eventually the king says to him, no kidding, come fight Napoleon. Captain Brock says, no, you were right. The Americans are coming. They're coming to take Canada. Thomas Jefferson said, a direct quote, the annexing of the Canadas will amount to not much more than a march. They were on their way. They wanted our water or something. So, so now I lecture all about the War of 1812, and then I say, and by the way, uh, when was the War of 1812? <laughs> right? Now, I'm looking for all the hands that go up, right? But here's the thing. What I'm really looking for is the one who didn't raise their hand, and he didn't raise his hand. And I want to teach him an important lesson, and that is pay attention to my class. So how can I teach? I'm an adult. How can I teach him that lesson? Call on him. Make them suffer the consequence of not paying attention to my class. Does this make sense? Yeah. So when was the War of 1812? Now, does adrenaline help your memory? <laughs> Under no circumstances. Adrenaline is something that you create in your body when you have fight or flight situations and you lose logical connection. At that point, when you, when you have a ton of adrenaline, like when you walk around the corner and see a lion, at that point you don't need to think, wow, lions are the largest feline species on the African <laughs> continent. You don't need that. You need up, down, fast, strong, tree. You just need quick logic. So in that moment, I go, when was the War of 1812? And he's like, ah, adrenaline. Can't think. Stand up. Stand up. And the kid's going, and the kid, teacher's going, he'll learn the lesson this time for sure. You want to know what lesson I learned when they did that to me? I learned this lesson. In September, when school starts, you listen to the lesson. 
and then you intentionally don't listen. You doodle excessively. You stare out the window. You even close your eyes. And then you wait for the teacher to call on you. And she says, she says, what is pie? And you're like, and she's expecting that she surprised you and you're gonna say dessert? And you stand up and go 3.14. And she's like, shit, he was paying attention. <laughs> she won't do that to you again for the rest of the year. You're now safe. That's the lesson I got. But this kid over here, the lesson this kid gets is, when was the war of 1812? His adrenaline is up. I make him stand up in front of the class and, and he's panicking. And, and the last thing he heard before the question was that the war ended in 1814. And he goes, uh, 1814. And he gets it wrong in front of the whole class. When will the children forget that he got it wrong? Never. Children are not nice. They're not, I'm not, 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 not your kids and my kids, but those other kids. <laughs> The other kids are not nice. And so they're never gonna forget that he made that mistake, not ever. In fact, he's gonna become a dot-com billionaire and show up at his 40, 40th anniversary, you know, for a high school reunion, all that stuff. He's gonna show up at the reunion, pull up in a limousine, having flown in on his private jet, walk into the room, and they go, 1814, you're back! <laughs> they're never gonna forget this. But the lesson that he got that day was not pay attention in class. The lesson he got that day is public speaking is fucking terrifying. And for the rest of his life, he'll carry that with him. Does this make sense? How many of you were told by your overbearing parent that you need to think before you speak? That children should be seen and not heard? That women should be seen and not heard? How about that? Anybody heard that one? Can you imagine? And so all through our childhood, we're being taught these things. And so we end up becoming less and less comfortable being ourselves and less and less comfortable with public speaking, less and less comfortable with communication in general. And that is what leads to you walking out of a party or walking out of a meeting and thinking to yourself, I wish I had said this. I wish I could have said that more effectively. And the reason I want you to hear me about this is that it can be turned back on. You do not need, like with golf, to spend the next 10 years learning. You have it inside you and it can be activated in a moment. It actually can be turned on in a second. That, that internal charisma, the internal ability to tell stories, it can be turned on very quickly. So I wanna talk a little bit about how to create the stage effect. And I want you to know that today, today I'm really talking about what the stage effect is, how it works and how you can use it. And then tomorrow in the workshop, I'm going to take you through exercises and drills and transform you, and I mean it. In one day, many of you will uplift your ability to communicate dramatically. Who's excited about that? Woo! All right. All right, now, before we do that, though, I want to see who... Let's, this is a tough question I'm going to ask, but I, I'd like to talk to somebody who's actually terrified of public speaking. I mean it. And I know this is a terrible thing to ask you because... I'm asking you, basically, like, who's terrified? I'm just making the fire. Who's afraid of fire? I'm just making the fire here. Come on up. I know it's a tough question, but I want to know who is really terrified of public speaking and tired of living that way? Who is terrified of public speaking and tired of living that way? Okay, can I have mic runners, please? I know, now they're like, I said, can I have mic runners? Hands down. <laughs> hands down. Okay, uh, hands up if, you're, if you want to let go of this feeling. And just, you pick somebody. Just, you go ahead. All right. Can you tell us your name? Hi. I'm Marita from Germany. Hello, Marita from Germany. So I'm sorry for putting you on the spot a little bit. I'm just curious, um, on a scale of uh, zero being I'm totally comfortable to be on stage any old time, a hundred is I'd rather vomit <laughs> and then eat my own vomit. <laughs> like, where are you on the scale? 70? She's 70. That's pretty <laughs> tough, man. She's not going to eat it, but it's coming out. <laughs> so, all right. And then, and then let me ask you this. If you were able to let go of it, what would you do with it? Why would you want to let go of it? Uh, I want to let go of it because I uh, built a concept um, for teaching. Uh, I want to be a coach. Uh, and uh, it's a German concept. I translated it, and I want to bring it to every English coach so that uh, they can work with us because I think that uh, really, really great tools I have. And, um, Guys, she's not a 70, she's a 54. <laughs> um, you can and see already, all she needs to do to overcome it is do more of this. Because you see she's getting more and more comfortable with every word. It's mm -hmm. almost down to just practice for her. Mm -hmm. 
She's getting more and more comfortable with every word. Really nicely done, thank you. I might come back to you, but I'm gonna just scope yeah, the room. Okay. Give her a hand, everybody. <laughs> Who else? Who else? Really terrified, you don't wanna to talk to me, but you're raising your hand anyway. By the way, Mike Runner, the best thing you wanna do is somebody who's like, got their hand like this. If they, it's really, they're not that afraid. This people, they're, they're, they're like this woman here, right here. No, 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 okay. But you gotta come back, there. Yeah, that's the, we're gonna to talk to you. Go ahead. So is it my turn? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, mm -mm. can Zero I Zero to 100, where are you? One, 100. Do you believe I her? I know you don't believe me. I, no, no, I'm gonna tell you, I know you don't believe me. I'm a very good manifester. <laughs> and I have a very good talent. So when I manifest, I'd, I had this dream that I'm gonna sing with Placido Domingo. I didn't really know who he was, but I heard his voice and I said that that's the guy I wanna sing with. She's not 100, she's like a minus six. Yes. <laughs> So all of a sudden, I did not just talk, you know, the specific thing, I didn't go to him. He called me when I was out with my Rottweilers walking in the wood, and I said, yeah, this is Placido. And I said, who? Domingo, you want to sing with me? I mean, Helsinki, you want to sing with me? And I said, what? Okay, and I hear you. No, we're, we're good. We got where you are. Fantastic. Okay. Excellent. Can I? Go, no. Can I? No. <laughs> you don't believe me. <laughs> Not, af not afraid of public speaking. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to this woman who's hiding behind the other woman. That's afraid of public speaking. Right here, there, yeah, there we go. Now you're seeing what we're talking about. Now you see. All right, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but I already can see the answer. Zero, totally comfortable, 100, it's very bad. Where are you? Not, not even lifting the microphone. <laughs> Okay, lift the microphone up, just a little higher. This is so not nice. I'm, I'm not nice. You should know that about me. So let me ask you, um, what's it like living with that fear? It's horrible, isn't it? And if you could let it go now, like if you could release it, if you could get to the other side of it, what would you do with it? Now you're talking. It's so bad for her that she can't even see the possibility. Do you understand? She can't even see the possibility. But you know what the crazy thing is? She wouldn't have raised her hand if she wanted to keep living with it. So she has, she has what we would call debilitating scariosity. She's trapped. She wants to overcome it, but the fear is so much. And right now, she's pissed off with herself for raising her hand. True? She is. She's not happy about it. So I have a really important question for you. Do you want to let it go? Now, with me? Are you willing to come up with me and do that? Give her a hand, everybody. <laughs> it's yours. <clears throat> I first of all want to really congratulate you for even this because I know exactly how this feels for you. What are, can you tell me some things you'd rather be doing right now? Like, <laughs> like a root canal? <laughs> yes. With no anesthesia? Yeah. Yeah. I've had one of those, it's not nice. Now, I want you guys to know that the fear that she's feeling right now is the equivalent that many of you will have felt when you really truly thought you were gonna die. Some of you guys might have seen on Instagram, Kirstie and I were on a plane that went into an emergency dive the other day, oxygen mask dropped from the ceiling, like we, it was over. And she's feeling right now the way Kirstie and her daughter felt on that plane. It, it's, it's not rational, she's not going to die. On the plane, we might have died. But she's got the same biochemistry right now. She's got the same fear chemicals. I can I ask you, um, do you remember a time when you felt comfortable to talk, when you felt comfortable to, to communicate? With children. She feels comfortable talking with children. And so what that probably means is that somewhere along the line, there were overbearing adults, parental or teaching, education-based often, uh, that, that kind of hurt that for her, that, that she got judgment and she's got concern about that judgment now. Children don't offer that judgment, so they're safe, yes? Okay. Um, Again, I'm gonna ask you this question, but I really want you to think about it. If you could become really comfortable 
with communicating to any audience, what are the things you'd be most likely to want to share with the world? To uh, give strength to people that are in the same position as me. Do you understand? Did you guys hear? I know she's not. Uh, yeah. Uh, Vishen and I are members of an organization called the Transformation Leadership Council. It was started by Jack Canfield, and the members are people like John Gray and Marianne Williamson and most of the cast of The Secret and so on. And we often joke at our meetings that all of us, what all of us ended up doing was, is we basically took our most significant dysfunctions and turned them into businesses. It's what we did. We took our, I had food problems, I turned it into a business. I had public speaking fear, I turned it into a business. Each of us took the thing that was our biggest pain. You just heard her say the same thing. She wants to go out and cure the world of the very thing that she's dealing with. Ironic, right? So, if you put a little trust in me, I think we can do it. I mean, I'm not saying we're gonna get you to zero, but I'll bet you that we can get you a long way there. Are you up for it? Okay, let's come over here. Give her a big hand. How many times do you think she's gonna try and give me that microphone? <laughs> All right, and what I'm gonna, you see the little X? That was for you. But, but you can face the other way. So stand on the X, but face me. All right? Now, a couple of things I want you guys to all understand is the way your lungs work. The way your lungs work is that if you breathe in different styles, you create a different internal biochemical response. If you breathe in the very top of your lungs, where you have a lot less of those little hairs that pull oxygen out, you actually slightly starve yourself of oxygen, and that causes you to create stress chemicals. This is why if you do walk around the corner and you see the lions, you take one sharp breath and then you stop breathing. Are you with me? You go, huh! and then you breathe in what I call prey breath. What I mean by prey breath is not that you're praying. You might be praying, but it's that you are now a prey animal. You don't wanna be heard, so you're breathing quietly in the top. And while you breathe quietly in the top, your body gets the message, oh shit, there's danger. And so the more you breathe shallow like that, the more danger you feel like you're in. The minute the plane yesterday, the minute, or two days ago, the minute the plane went into the dive, the minute the oxygen mask dropped down, the first thing I started doing was deep breathing. Calm, deep breathing. Then I put my shoes on, because I'm gonna need shoes. I saw Bruce Willis in Die Hard. Barefoot is bad. <laughs> it's not good. And then I realized that you're not allowed to take your bags off the plane and stuff in an emergency landing. So I immediately went and got the passports, I got my phone, I put them all inside my vest. That's called rational thought. That's not what most of the people around me were doing. But I was deep breathing, so I was getting all the adrenaline out. Are you guys with me? So the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is actually breathe, because she stopped doing that about 10 minutes ago. So can you breathe? No. All right, I'm gonna help you with it. So when my hand is up here, can you want me to hold that for a second? You okay? <laughs> you guys, do you understand 100? Do you understand when I say that it's the same for her as being on a plane, that it, like, it, the same fear is there? The difference is it's irrational. Is anybody here, I'm just curious, anybody planning to kill her? No? <laughs> it's like the hitchhiker, and the hitchhiker's driving along, and he pulls up, she is driving along, she picks up a hitchhiker, and the hitchhiker, they're talking, small talk, and then the hitchhiker says to her, gee, I'm amazed, you know, as a woman, that you pulled over and picked me up on the road like that. Like, what if I was a serial killer? And she goes, what are the odds of two of us? <laughs> Now, I want you to take a totally deep breath in with me. Slower. Which kids do you like to talk to the most? What age? You're all right. What age do you like to talk to the most? The younger ones. Younger ones. Like six? I have to do that on Friday. I'm terrified. They, they're making me go and they're putting me in the room with children. Like, like seriously. And then they want me to talk to children about food. I think they're going to throw the food at me. What, you, what do you like to talk to kids about? Uh, fun things. 
fun things? Okay, I want you to try something with me. I'm gonna stand behind you, and you see the wings? Are they wings or eyes? Vishen, I never knew. <laughs> I, depends on what you draw around them. All right, so I want you to look at the wings, and at the same time I'm look at, you're looking at the wings, I want you to not look at my fingers, but I want you to notice them. Can you notice my fingers? And breathe. And notice my fingers, but keep looking at the wings, and keep noticing my fingers, and look at the wings. There you go. Keep notice breathing. Okay, hold on. That's not breathing. That's definitely not breathing. Just take one deep breath with me. Look at me. You're okay. Everybody loves you. I'm going to give you guys a secret. She doesn't believe you. No, she doesn't. This is a weird irony of humans. You, the more nervous you act, the more sympathy you get, and the less sympathy you believe in. It's a terrible twist. Yeah, see? <laughs> Take a deep breath. And know it's okay. Through your nose. I have to tell you, when I see this, and I see it a lot, it makes me angry because somebody did this to her. And not necessarily just one person, but likely one, maybe two. And it just irritates the hell out of me. But the good news is, is that she can get to the other side of it. And the way she's going to get to the other side of it is just method, method, methodically breathing and going through the steps. So I want you with me to breathe exactly like I do. Are you ready? So we're gonna go out, out through the mouth. You're not, you're not going out. Out through the mouth, and then in. Nice, out, in. Keep doing that, and then look at the wings, and notice my fingers. And keep your awareness on my fingers, even as they're out to your peripheral vision, and keep breathing. Keep breathing. Calming. Eyes open. Notice my fingers. And then I want you to take your awareness and just bring it through the whole room. I want you to feel the walls on the side of you. I want you to feel the whole room behind you. I want you to feel the love and the intention that people hold for you. You feel the breathing's better? Breathing nicely. Now, you've got a group of kids in front of you. What's the best vacation they should ever take? Where, where should they go one day on a vacation? To the beach? Is there a particular beach? I, they can't hear you, the kids over here. They can't hear you. <laughs> so just hold it right there and tell the kids on the, about the beach. These kids. What's the best beach for them to go to? Well, I, I know one uh, where I grew up. Yes. And there's lots of space and, um, and there's all tides. It's really nice. It's like a little swimming pool. And what if they're afraid of the water? I, I could take them to the water. What would you tell them about the water? There's no reason to be afraid. Yeah? Uh, and how much fun could they have? Lots of fun. Lots, lots of splashing if they don't want to go in. Yeah? And where is, like, the best vacation you've ever had? The funnest trip you've ever been on? Yeah. Here? What's been best? Have you been here the whole time? Don't you wish you were here the whole time? Yes. I do. <laughs> so what's been best about this week? Uh, everyone can be just who, who, they, who they are. Everyone can be just who they are? Does that include you? Yes. Yeah? And what's that like? Uh, it's motivating. It's sorry? <laughs> I, the microphone's a little far from your mouth. I can't. <laughs> Easily 
liberating. Yeah. Can you tell me what's one of your favorite sessions that you've been to here so far? Not this one. <laughs> <laughs> one star rating right here. I can see it coming. down to our level. Um, um, I have a mutual admir admir admiration for, um, for lots of brilliant speakers here and, and um, I become really admired <laughs> how, they, how they come to our level. And is that what you do when you're speaking with kids? Yes. What, and do you speak to kids sometimes? Do you teach or...? Hmm? Yeah, excellent. Can you lift the microphone a little bit? What, what grade do you teach? Um, I, I don't teach. I, I'm a music teacher. Oh, excellent. Yeah. What kind of music? Uh, instrumental. Mm. Okay, help me out. We, we went to this party last night. And there was a guy playing the guitar. And I've been trying to play the guitar. But ever since seeing him last night, I've decided that I should turn my guitar into a coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could, but <laughs> I think, I think can you should. can you do me a favor? Do you have like um, do you do you ever teach the kids about rhythm? Yes. Can you teach Can you teach me about rhythm? Um. Us. You can teach us about rhythm. Yes, but it's embarrassing because <laughs> I I uh, we we use a method that um, teaches children um, about rhythm. Uh, using words. Uh, you guys want to learn about rhythm using words? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. All right, go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just me. <laughs> no. <laughs> no the, um, okay, just start it. You don't have to do the whole thing, but just give us a start so we get a sense. Uh, usually there are such certain rhythms that... <laughs> How many of you would go away feeling awfully go away feeling very empty if she didn't share this with us? Yeah. Would you like us to act like children? Would that help? No. No. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, the idea behind method is if, if you want to teach a child a certain rhythm, if you relate it with... No, no, no. Don't teach us how to teach. Teach us. Don't, you wouldn't say that to children, right? Children, if you would like to teach a child... <laughs> we are children. Teach us. She's not kidding. Okay, so, so if um, so you have to copycat. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's different ones, the basic ones you can learn. Um, one of them is <laughs> um, if you are willing to clap. No. No. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to hold no. it. He'll, he'll hold it for you. It's okay. Okay, take the mic away. It's okay. We don't need it. Just go ahead. Show us. We need to copy you. I remember. Because I was listening. It was 1812. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so she does it, we copy. I'm a little monkey. That's awesome. 
Yeah, please. I'm a little monkey. Thunderbolts of lightning, very, very frightening. <laughs> Give her a big hand, everybody. <laughs> no, it's your turn. No. <laughs> You're really, really like, nice charisma. You're really good energy. You gotta let go of this stuff. It's not right. I don't care who did it to you. Okay. So All right, now I need to make a deal with you guys. You guys are all going to be super tempted. She, I've celebritized her, and so you're going to be super tempted to want to tell her how great she was, and you're going to be super tempted to tell her how strong and beautiful she was, and I don't want any of you to do that. And, I, and I'm going to tell you why. She won't believe you. And the reason she won't believe you is that she showed us her nerves, and nervousness is an inauthentic plea for sympathy and attention. Nervousness is an inauthentic, when, when it's fake. If you're nervous about jumping out of a plane, I'm, giving, I'm going to give you, that's fair. But when you're nervous about this type of thing, it's an inauthentic plea. We learn to act nervous to get more feedback. Never communicate with an audience that you're nervous because if you do, you will not believe anything they say to you after that. Do you hear me? So the trouble is if you come and tell her, oh my God, you are so strong and you are so amazing, she will not believe you and you will actually create the reverse response in her. She never got to zero in this exercise, but she got to about 50. She got to 50, is that fair? And she, you, her energy changed, her show, she couldn't even breathe when she came up here. But if you really want to support her, then you don't make a big deal out of it for her. If you're talking with her and she brings it up and she asks you for your honest opinion, then you can offer it. But I don't want any false platitudes and unfortunately anything you offer right now will feel like a false platitude to her. Does this make sense? You have an agreement? All right, now let me ask you something. Are you glad you came up here? Look at her face. Do you see this? That is genuine. She's not comfortable, but she's not terrified. She came up here phobic. Now she's just a little further down the scariosity table. And, and, and if you want to fix this, then I suggest to you that the simple, simple thing, there's more stuff, and we're gonna talk about that in detail tomorrow, but one of the simplest things you can do is just challenge yourself to practice a little. You, as you were here, your fear was like, well, your fear was here, and the longer you were up here and the more you spoke, the fear came down and down and down, and you started to be able to breathe. And the truth is, daddy or teacher or somebody gave you some shit for sharing your views, and, and, and there's some part of you that's still afraid of that judgment that's gonna come in. There's none of that in this world now. You're, you're a powerful, powerful communicator, and I hope that you keep getting your voice out there to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, 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 one more time, one more time. No, no, just feel the love, that's all. Okay. That's bravery. Bravery to be even willing to come up here and, and face that and, and spend that time with me. And I want you to know that every one of us that has any nervousness, you might be thinking, well, God, I think I'm not that. If you have any nervousness at all, you're on that scale. Because you shouldn't. If you're prepared, if you know your stuff, there's no reason for you being nervous about this. And I want to tell you a little bit about this because it, it was controlling my entire life. It was controlling my entire life. I was so terrified of public speaking that if you came up to me and you said, Eric, can you come do a talk for, for my team or my organization on Friday? And you said that to me on Monday. On Monday, I would tell you, hell no. That's not going to happen. Then I would be unable to eat until your event was over on Friday. I already said no. But the nervousness was so locked inside me that until your event was over, and there's a clue there's an incredible clue in this. Why was I still nervous? Why was I unable to eat even though I'd said no? Somebody's got it. Why? Because they may call again, that's possible. Because I wanted to. Because I had scariosity. 
on some level I wanted to. And I, the thing I was most afraid of is that I might say yes. That's what I was afraid of. That's what I was terrified of. And my dad called me one day. And my dad, my dad is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know I'm not supposed to tell you that, like anonymous, but he tells everybody. <laughs> so I think I'm allowed. And my father calls me at work one day and he says to me, Eric, it's my birthday, my AA birthday. You know, the, the way it works in AA is every year that you've been sober, you get a chip and a cake and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and it's his AA birthday. And he says, Eric, it's my AA birthday. Would you please come and give me my cake? <laughs> no, no, why not? I'm busy. I haven't even told you what day it is. I'm still busy. I'm not doing that. No way am I doing that. No way. Why? Because he's, he goes to a very big meeting. There's like 200 people. Uh, no way am I doing that. I was so terrified. Put the phone down. Calls me back. But, but Eric, please. And he, he does this every day for a few days in a row. Like just calling me every day. He, he, my sponsor's out of town. My best friend is out of town. You've got to do it. You're the best one to do it. No way. Not doing it. And he goes, Eric, come on. It's not like it's a big one. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, well, it's, not, it's my 13th. It's not like the 10th or the 5th or whatever. You know, those are the big ones. And I, I, in my head, I, at that point, I suddenly think, man, you just don't understand sobriety. How could one year of sobriety be more important than the other just because it has a round number? <laughs> uh, I don't understand that. I was like, you're, you're, what? And in that moment, I thought, well, if I was going to give you a cake, I'd have a thing or two to share with you about sobriety. And then my mouth goes, I'll do it. Whoa! <laughs> And he hung up. <laughs> he, he knew I was going to change my mind. And, and I, I, like, no, I'm not doing this. I don't want to do it. But now I've agreed to do it. But, but wait a second. There's a clue in what I just shared with you. And that is that when your mission, when you have a message that starts to become more powerful than your curiosity, it starts to bring your, your, your curiosity up and your, then your fear will come down. And that's what happened that moment is I suddenly had a message. And once I had a message, I wanted to get it out there. So the more passionate you become about your message, the easier it will be for you to become more comfortable speaking. Does this make sense? So now I have to get ready for this thing. Now, now this is how I first discovered dieting because I lost weight for about 10 days. <laughs> I couldn't eat. I was like feeling sick every day. I show up at the meeting and the room is not much different in size than this. I mean, it's a little less people, but it's about, the, it's a deeper room with about 200 some odd people. And I'm like, and I, I, I sit at the very back. Why was I sitting at the back? I was seriously thinking of leaving. I'm not kidding you. That's how bad it was for me. I, I was sitting at the back because I was thinking of just bailing on him. I was so sick. Now I'm sitting at the back and then, and then, there's a guy that's getting his cake before my dad. And he goes up to get his cake. Now, how many of you guys have seen Groundhog Day? Has anybody seen this Groundhog Day? Groundhog Day, do you guys remember Ned Ryerson? Yes. Now, for those of you who haven't seen Groundhog Day, in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray has to have the same day over and over and over and over again. And every time he lives the same day over and over again, he bumps into Ned Ryerson. And Ned Ryerson is the caricature of an obnoxious American insurance salesman. Excuse me, sir, can I talk to you about your life insurance? You know, it's like that guy. And this guy who was here getting his cake that day looked and acted more like Ned Ryerson than the actor who played Ned Ryerson. <laughs> and uh, it was, it, it was and, and, and the other thing I didn't know, and I, I, if I'd known it might've been different, but I didn't know this. They didn't like him. The group didn't like him. And that's very unusual at an AA meeting. They, it's, a, it's a brotherhood and a sisterhood and a family. It's very unusual, but here's why they didn't like him. Because he only ever showed up for meetings on his birthday. All year he'd be living his life and he'd just show up on his day. And he'd be like, hey guys, I'm here for the cake. Can you see why they might not have liked him so much? So he's up there on the stage and I'm, I don't know this about him. So when he walks up and the audience has this icky, gray, sludgy, ectoplasmic energy about them. I'm thinking, I'm going to have that. I'm sitting in the back going, oh, these guys are horrible audience. And then Ned walks up and he goes, hi, my name is Ned and I'm an alcoholic. So now I know something about a few of you. <laughs> hi, my name is Ned and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Ned. And he, and, he, and he starts his talk like this. He goes, wow, guys, it's so good to be here. I just got back from LA. Anybody here been to LA? This is, this is not how AA meetings work. You don't 
work the room. Has anybody here been to LA? You don't go and talk to boost your own significance. The audience is cringing at his lack of rapport. Has anybody been to LA? And this one woman, nobody raises their hand. I mean, they know this is out of context. This is not how you speak. But this one woman, her hand raises by itself. No, I saw her hand and she watched it. What the hell are you doing? What, what, why are you doing that? And as soon as he saw that one hand, he's like, oh, oh, you've been to LA. Now, let me tell you something. If you're in AA, if you're in AA and you live in Vancouver, you've been to LA. That's one of the reasons you're in AA. Uh, you've been to LA. Everybody's been to LA. But this one woman's hand, he goes, oh, you've been to LA. He goes, well, I was visiting my brother. And my brother, he, he lives in this, like there's a 7-Eleven and he lives upstairs. And if you go onto the back balcony and you just go out over the back balcony, you can see the Hollywood sign. What are you doing? <laughs> like the audience hates him, by the way. I'm sitting at the very back over there and, and I'm sitting amongst a group of guys. It turns out they're all airline pilots. I don't know if this is good news or bad news. <laughs> uh, but, 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 I, but I learned something about airline pilots. We know that drummers are crazy, yes? Drummers in rock bands are crazy. They, they, we know that about them. Goalkeepers in hockey and football, they're crazy. But the third crazy is airline pilots. They're a little crazy and they're back there and they're, 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 they're making comments about Ned. They're saying shitty stuff about him and I'm sitting with them and I'm next on stage. And I'm like, oh. I'm like, I'm sitting, I'm, I, I'm seriously thinking, my, my body's going, all right, take it up to the top of the neck. <laughs> Get ready for expulsion. I'm seriously gonna vomit. Ned's, and, and I, you know, like we, this, oh, I've been to LA and the Hollywood sign, that is not how you talk at A, unless, unless, if the story continues. So I ran up to the Hollywood sign and I climbed up to the top and I snorted a line of cocaine and drank a bottle of tequila. Now it's an AA story. But otherwise, it's just you self-aggrandizing yourself in front of the audience, and that's what he was doing that day, and it was awful. But I didn't realize that the problem was him. I thought that it was the audience. They, they didn't like him, and the pilots are making jokes, and I'm so sick, and then finally, it's my turn to come up on stage. And I walk up, and I'm like, I, I'm barely able to make it. Thank God there was a podium. I, I walk over to the podium. The podium prevented the falling over. I was holding on to it. And you know, when you get that afraid, by the way, where are you? Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Did your vision start to go at one point? You, the, the, the sides of your vision? See, the sides of her vision started to go. That's why I got her to look at my fingers like that. When you are afraid, you become very focused. When you are relaxed, you are very relaxed and your gaze is wide. And so what happened to her is her, and why? Because if there's a lion, you don't need to see the acacia tree unless you want to climb it, which you might. So, so what's happening is my peripheral vision starting to fade on me, which is like just slightly before passing out. And she was not far from passing out. I'm telling you right now, that's why I held her hand. And that's how I was up there. I was like this, and I'm holding on to the podium. And, and, and then you know the expression, the English expression, knocking knees? You know what I'm talking about? Knocking knees? I, I thought it was always an exaggeration. Now my knees are knocking so hard behind the podium that I have bruises. I am so terrified and I'm up there. And, and here's the problem. I said to my dad when he asked me to come and speak, I said, you have to be a member of AA to speak at AA. I'm not even a member. And he goes, well, you don't drink. <laughs> Once again, I don't think you understand Alcoholics Anonymous very well. It's not for people who don't drink. It's for people, I mean, it, it's, 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 you've got it backwards. Now I feel like drinking. I tell you, I'm telling you right now, two shots of tequila, I would have been fine. It would have been okay. I'm sitting back there, I'm terrified, and I'm supposed to say, hi, my name is Eric. And, I, and by the way, I even said to my dad, what am I supposed to do about the intro? My name is Eric and I'm, an, I'm not an alcoholic. And he goes, just say you are. <laughs> but I'm not! And he goes, yeah, but again, you don't drink, so. <laughs> no, I'm not lying to this group of people. So I'm standing up there and, I, and, I, and I'm behind the podium and I don't know where this comes from, like weird, we, you know, stuff's flashing in my head. And suddenly I see like, the, the, you know, I feel like I'm in a courtroom drama, you know, like the old Perry Mason or the old, you know, those old courtroom dramas. And I'm standing out there and I'm freaking out. My dad's sitting down here. Uh, Hi, my name is Eric and my father's the alcoholic. <laughs> they busted out laughing. 
they busted out laughing. And as soon as they started laughing, my vision came back. And that's exactly what happened to you. Her vision started to go and I made a joke. You guys all laughed and she relaxed. Very big clue in this. I walked out here and told you about a dog with laryngitis. I got you guys all to laugh. I don't need to relax when I walk up here anymore, but the audience sometimes does. Do you know, I'll tell you right now, when you're a speaker, there's something you need. How many of you have been to a conference? It's not this one, but how many of you have ever been to a conference? You've paid money or your company's paid money to send you there, and 70% of the speakers made you want to die in your seat. <laughs> Anybody been to that conference? Like, that's, that's what's going on. And you need to know that everyone sitting in any audience is afraid of that. They're afraid of it. Many of you, by the way, I know something about you. Those of you who are sitting in the middle, well, here in Mind Valley University, you feel safe. You want to sit front and center, and it's all good. In fact, some of you rush in here to get your seats, and I think that's amazing. But if you're at an average conference, you might sit on the aisle. I know, and in fact, there are some people here who sat on the aisle at the end of the, because they don't really know me, and they're like, is this going to work? They want to know that they can escape. They want to know that they can get out. I, I, I used to have a film studio in Northern California. And my film studio used to be part of Industrial Light and Magic, so we're talking serious movies. We were working on Avatar, and we worked on Iron Man, Pirates of the Caribbean, and we would get invited to all the film festivals. So I went off to this film festival with my wife at the time, and the only seats that were available were like right in the middle. And we're sitting in this, and, and we would get tickets to all the movies, so we wouldn't even know what movie we were going to watch. So we were going to watch some movie. We don't know anything about it. And we're sitting there, and the movie comes on, and it is the worst movie it is worse than the worst home movie you've ever seen. It is the worst movie I've ever seen. I'm sitting there and I'm about to think, I'm, thinking, I'm never going to get this two hours of my life back. And I want to leave. But the problem is I own this studio, which is famous. And everybody in Marin County knows me by sight. So uh, the minute I stand up and the director and the producer are here, the actors are over here, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So I, I just, I can't leave. I'm trapped. Every audience you ever face, there will be people in the audience that are concerned about being trapped in case you suck. That's the truth of it. So getting them to relax at the beginning is really, really helpful. So what happened in this case, though, luckily, so my wife and I are sitting there, and then the people beside us, they all decide to get up. Do you guys know drafting? Do you guys know drafting? Drafting is when you're driving a Mini. I don't know why I'm thinking of a Mini. It was just happening to be my first car. And then there's an 18-wheeler truck, a big truck, a big articulated lorry, they would call it in England, you know, big truck, and then you pull up really close behind the truck, and then you basically take your foot off the gas, and the truck sucks you down the highway. Are you guys with me? It's very unsafe, but very good gas mileage. <laughs> very good gas mileage. It's called drafting. So these four people got up, and suddenly my wife and I are like, oh my God, we can draft them. And when they stand up, everybody looks, and then they don't look anymore, and we can just draft in behind them. So this is perfect. This is so perfect. So we're like, they get up, she gets up, I get up, but I want to get up really carefully. I want to make a noise. I put my hand on the chair, and, I, and then I, that's when I found out that they're folding picnic tables, chairs. I put my hand on the chair, and I'm like. <laughs> Every, I, I hold my hand up so my wife could lift me up. She's gone. <laughs> now everybody's looking. I'm lying. It was horrible. Every audience that you will ever face is a little afraid of that type of thing, getting trapped in the middle. Does this make sense? So, so in any event, I do this, you know, hi, I'm, I'm Eric, and my dad's the alcoholic, and I get a laugh, and immediately I get that laugh, I start feeling better. And, and so I share my message, and I say, listen, the truth of the matter is, I don't want to be here. I'm terrified of public speaking. I hate this. But when my dad called me and said to me that I should come and do this cake because it's his 13th year and not a big one like the 10th or the 20th or the 15th or something, I said, I needed to come here and say something to all of you. And that is that there's only one day of sobriety that is more important than all the others, and that is day one. Day one is the most important day, but after that, in my opinion, as the child of an alcoholic, as the brother of an alcoholic, as the, as the employee of an alcoholic, I had them all around me, my message is that every single day of sobriety is just as important as the other one. I don't care if it's your 10th year, your 13th year, your third year, or your 27th day. They're all important. This was my message. This is a good message. I was very passionate about it. And then I said to them, by the way, not only is my father saved by this program, alive because of AA, not only that, but how about my boss? My best friend, I said, even my brother, even my brother, he was in the program by the time he was 19 years old. It was that or death. I said, even my brother who lives in Tokyo. I go, has anybody here ever been to Tokyo? <laughs> <laughs> I 
and they're, they're a little more subtle than you guys, they giggle. They just giggled, because they knew what I'd done. It was, what I'd done is naughty. But they, they giggled. But their giggle kind of, you know, the funny thing is, is that when you make an audience laugh, you start feeling more brave. So they, they, they everybody been to Japan and they giggle. Nobody raised their hand. I go, well, my brother lives in this shop. <laughs> And if you go upstairs and you lean up, and, and by the way, they didn't have a microphone, so by the, I could never even finish it. They were laughing so loudly, they couldn't hear me anymore. One of the pilots is on the floor. He, he fell out of his chair, and that's how my talk ended. Uh, okay, my dad's coming now. And off I went. It was hilarious. Now, a couple lessons in this. AA meeting's over, and now all these people want to come talk to me. They all come up to me and they're like, oh, Eric, that was this magnificent. God, that was amazing. You've got to come back. What? <laughs> Absolutely not. Never going to happen. They're like, no, but I really needed to hear that today. That's the exact message I needed to hear. You know, I come to the meeting and I meet people that have been sober for like 10 years and I think they're better than me. Like, and now I know every day of sobriety is amazing. And you really, and they're giving me, and it's like probably 80 people walking up and saying stuff like this to me. And I did not believe any of them. I did not believe any of them. Why? Because I had told them I was nervous. And so I knew they were giving me false platitudes and they were giving me niceness because I, I knew that. I knew every time they said it, I'm like, you're just saying that. Do you understand? So I want you to hear me about this. You never, ever, not ever tell the audience that you're nervous. I don't care how you feel. And by the way, I said this in front of an audience once and the audience said, yeah, but Eric, earlier today, you said that you have to be authentic on stage. Ooh. Tricky. I, I heard this uh, young politician was wanting to, he met an old grizzled American congressman and he said to him, you know, you've, you've, you've risen to such power. You've held on to your congressional seat for 30 years. Do you have any advice for a young politician like me who I want to reach to the highest office in the land? And the old, the old congressman said, well, yeah, I mean, you know, um, it, it really comes down to integrity, honesty. Uh, it, it comes down to authenticity. You know, once you can fake those things. <laughs> I didn't believe any of them. I didn't believe a single one of them. But then all of a sudden, I'm kind of done, and I'm in shock, and it's all over. And then all of a sudden, I see Ned Ryerson. Ned starts walking over to me. And I'm starting to feel bad about what I did. I, I made fun of him in front of everybody. And I, I, sometimes when you're on stage, you kind of get carried away. And, I, 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 and he's walking over, and I'm going, oh, man. And he walks up to me, and he goes, Eric? He goes, I don't come here enough, but if the talks were like that, I would. He said, that was one of the best speeches I've ever seen at an A meeting ever in my life. Did I believe him? Absolutely. He has no reason to give me sympathy. I believed him, and suddenly I started thinking about the other 80 people. And then he said this, and I kid you not, you know this, this, oh, this delicate population, he, don't push my buttons. Come on now, guys, don't trigger my triggers. Who built the button? If you have buttons, who built it? You did. Why did you build it? So people could push it. <laughs> it's like you're walking around with these buttons, like, don't push them. What, 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 they're there. <laughs> don't push your buttons. You know what happened in that moment was I pushed his buttons. And then he said to me, after he said what he said about my talk, and he goes, and you know, I really got the message. I needed to hear that. I have new respect for Ned, and I learned a huge amount about public speaking of myself just in that one day, and I'm hoping you got some of it with me. Was it good? Yeah. Now, the reason I wanted to show you that is that there are lessons that I shared with you in that story that you will remember. In fact, there are some of you who have heard that story from me before because you've been training with me or you've seen it on video, but what I'm going to suggest to you is that many of you will remember that story possibly for years to come. You will start preparing for a talk one day and you'll remember, oh yeah, it's important to trigger a laugh early on. You will remember it's not a good idea to communicate that I'm nervous because I didn't just lecture it at you. I took you on a journey where you felt like you had the experience with me. Does this make sense? It's super powerful stuff. Very powerful stuff. Now, as long as we're talking a little bit about um, connection with an audience, I want to share something with you about something I call broad spectrum appeal. So I, I started speaking and I never, it was really a hobby for me when I started. And something that never dawned on me was that 
the event organizers like pull the audience and you know get ratings on speakers. I didn't care about that stuff. I didn't know anything about it. And how I found out about it was that um, I got okay. Who wants to get published on Mind Valley? Anybody here? Who would like to be published? On? I'm going to tell you how I did it. Does anybody want to know? Yes. You know, maybe I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> Who's coming tomorrow? Yes. All right, I'll tell you now. Then I'll tell you now. So basically what happened was, Vision and I are in this group, the TLC, and the Transformational Leadership Council. And um, I've been a member there for some time, and when Vision joined, people told me who Vision, I didn't really know anything about Mind Valley and, and, and stuff, but a, a very quick I could see, everybody's like, oh, we want to get published by, my, by Mind Valley. And I'm, I was basically, honestly, when I joined TLC, I wasn't even really a speaker. I joined because a bunch of the TLC members and I were good friends, and they just wanted me to come hang out. I was barely doing any speaking at that stage, and and so on. In the meantime, I had started doing some speaking and I had created WildFit. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to get WildFit published by Mind Valley? I thought that. And, and the trouble is, is that everybody wanted to be published by Mind Valley. In fact, here's what I didn't know. What I didn't know is that at that point in time, Mind Valley had about 80 authors, and Vision had made the very, I believe, wise decision to drill down and get rid of most of them and focus on the most impactful authors. So he's going to go from, what, 80 to 15 or something. So while he's culling the herd, I want to join. Right? I want to join. And so, uh, but how do you do that? Now, I've, I've now known Vision for a very long time, and I'll tell you something that I've seen over and over again. People see him at AFES or here or out in the world where we're out in places, and they walk up and go, Vision, you really got to see my stuff. Vision, you really got to publish me on Mind Valley. I'm like, oh, you dumbass. <laughs> like, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Here's how it worked for me. Vision and I happened to be on a bus on one of our TLC trips. We happened to sit beside each other, and, and I go to Vision. Hey, uh, Vision, what are you uh, interested in these days? Like, what's, what's, what are you curious about? And he goes, he looks up from his phone. <laughs> he, says, he says, biohacking. And I go, no kidding, that's what I'm talking about tomorrow. <laughs> Wasn't talking about biohacking. Here's the deal. Vision's a busy guy, and I had watched the pattern. He shows up for the talks that are directly related to what he's researching at that point in time, and he's busy. He doesn't go to the other talks. I was an unknown guy. I, I, I had 26 views on one video on YouTube. He was not coming to my talk until he found out it was about biohacking. <laughs> yeah, he twitches his schedule around, and he shows up, and the talk that I was giving was about something that I now call the evolution gap, it was about evolutionary biology. And the truth of the matter is, is that any biohacking that does not have a foundation in evolutionary biology is dangerous, in my opinion. And so I just had to add a little bit in there to make it about biohacking. Vision comes along and he says, he comes to the talk, and the minute I walked off the stage from the talk, he goes, you gotta come speak at AFEST. Interesting? Right? One step at a time. So I go to AFEST. Now, I don't know anything about AFEST. It's actually funnier than that because I wasn't really a speaker back then. So Vision comes and says, can you go over to AFEST? It was May, I think, of that year, 2014, 2015, something, in Mykonos. And he goes, can you, can you speak at AFEST? I'm like, yeah. Then my friend Colin Sprake from Vancouver says, Eric, that was amazing. One talk can change your life. Two people come up and want me to speak at, at nice events. He goes, can you speak? And I'm like, yeah, because I had nothing in my calendar. So I had just agreed to speak in Mykonos and Vancouver on the same weekend. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I don't know if you guys, I, you know, like, I don't know how geographic, I, I'm assuming most people in this crowd are pretty geographically aware. I don't know if you've seen this, you're walking around America and you ask Americans where Canada, Canada is. <laughs> I just, if I were the American guy, I'd ban that show. That's embarrassing. But, but here's the thing. I, I finish off in Vancouver, and I've booked the flights and stuff, and I'm going to make it, but I'm not going to be at all of AFES. I, I can't. And that's usually the culture. You know, as a speaker, you go for the whole thing. I don't know any of that. So I finish off in Vancouver. I don't have time to stay for anything. I can't stay for selfies, pictures, solder, not nothing. I quite literally come off the stage. Security clears the path for me. I run straight to the limousine, off to the airport. Three flights later, I land in Mykonos. I land in Mykonos, and Mia, who knows Mia? Mia! Mia, the phenomenal host of AFES, is, well, the technical term for it is she's losing her shit because she can't find me. And I need to be on stage, and I've just arrived, and she can't find me, and then we kind of find each other on Messenger, and then we don't know each other. And she walks up to me, and she goes, when did you get in? I go, I don't know, 20 minutes ago. From Vancouver? Yeah. You're on stage? Yeah. Why are you so calm? 
Well, because I'm calm like that. I just don't do that. I'm, I'm pretty laid back. And, she, and we started talking about that stuff. And, 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 and I told her about this one time when, and you guys will hear the story in detail tomorrow, but I told her about this one time when I was on stage with a producer and they kept changing my time clock while I was on stage. And, and, and I told her about that. And now, now, here's the thing. She's from New Zealand. And if you know anything, every culture has their, you know, like, like those of you who are from Scandinavia, you know, yanta law, right? You shall not think you're special. You know, every country has that. Well, in Australia and New Zealand, it's called tall puppy syndrome. So if you're too full of yourself, you've got to cut him down to size, right? So now she, at first she calmed down. Now she's thinking, this guy's bragging. This guy's bragging. So now I go out on stage and I deliver my talk and she messes with my time clock while I'm up there. I don't know if she added five minutes or she took five minutes off. I don't remember at this point, but I still finished dead on time. I finished dead on time because when you're a speaker, you finish dead on time. You never run over time. You might think that the audience is your client, but you're not my client. I, I love you. I care about you. I'm here to deliver to you, but my client is Mind Valley. And Mind Valley's given me a schedule, which means I need to stick to that schedule. So she messed with the clocks and I adjusted it, and I'm going to teach you how to do that tomorrow, where you can finish on time every single time without even a worry. And I finished dead on time. That night at dinner, I'm sitting having dinner and I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like in the A-Fest and it's quite a community. I mean, Gotham's little cult jokes earlier, like A-Fest, that's like, I, I, I thought they were gonna start serving Kool-Aid. I really did. <laughs> we're having dinner and then Vision comes up to me and he says, Eric, uh, we had some complaints today about your presentation. I'm like, what? I've never heard those words in my life. What are you talking about? And he goes, people are saying we didn't give you enough stage time. So can you go up again tomorrow? Now, something you need to know. If you want me to talk for two or three hours, my preparation time is about five minutes. Quite literally. If you want me to talk for an hour, I need 15 to 20 minutes. You want me to talk for 30 minutes? You want me to talk for 20 minutes? I need a week. Do you understand? The more compressed it is, the more focus I need to have. I'm doing an 18-minute talk in Germany in front of 4,000 people in about a week. I am working on that. I got to get it down. You have to choose the words. Got to understand it. Now Vision says, can you do a talk again tomorrow, another 20 minutes? I have 24 hours and an A-Fest party. <laughs> no, I have 12 hours in an A-Fest party. And Vision's taking 20 minutes out of his own presentation to give it to me. And so I go home and I use the formula, which I will share, your, share with you tomorrow. I use a formula and I create a talk. And about three weeks later, Vishen calls me and he says, uh, Eric, I'm really, really glad that we invited you to A-Fest. He says, you know, we poll all the clients and he says, your talk was the second highest rated talk of all of A-Fest. And I want you to know something. There were phenomenal speakers there. I felt quite, and I was like, I tried to say thank you. And, he, and then he went, shut up. <laughs> I went, what? And he goes, and your other talk, he says, your second talk, the one you made up the night before, that one was number one. <laughs> he says, you pushed me to number three. <laughs> and that was the first time that I became aware that that was going on. And, 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 you know, it makes sense, but I started thinking about that. I started thinking about it from the perspective of what we call broad spectrum appeal. How do you get broad spectrum appeal. How many of you have been to a talk where you can see some of the audience is really in and some of the audience is totally not in, right? My goal when I go on stage, no matter what the topic, is that 99% of the audience is going to have a good time. Whether the information is perfect for them or not, they're going to have a good time. Does that make sense? So there are some powerful tips for making that happen. And one of them is the effective use of stories. Story is everything. Story is everything. There's a reason that movie studios will spend $200 million to entertain you for two hours. It's because you like stories. And by the way, you think you like original stories. You don't. You just like the same stories told in original ways. Basically, I'm gonna tell you a story. You tell me what story it is. Uh, young boy, orphaned. Feels, feels a bit different. Finds an old mentor with a beard. And, then, and has some skills that the old man helps him to develop. And then he had, Lord of the Rings, you know, Star Wars, Harry Potter. It's all the same story. 
By the way, if you want a secret, it's, it happens on 30 year cycles. So you want to write something like that about 30 years after Harry Potter. It's going to blow up, <laughs> right? It's going to blow up. But the point is that we like stories and, there are, and, and we like stories to be told really well and we like to feel. And, and, and so I want to give you a little bit of a clinic on stories and then tomorrow I'll go much deeper into storytelling and we'll actually do some exercises that'll blow your mind. So how many of you guys know Janet Atwood? Does anybody know Janet? Janet is a dear friend of mine. Uh, she's also a member of TLC. She wrote The Passion Test, New York Times bestseller. She wrote The Hidden Riches. Um, and she's just a phenomenally interesting woman. And she and I were doing an event in Copenhagen. And she came up to me after I came off the stage and she says, how do you do that? And I, I said, what? She goes, that. <laughs> Janet, what? <laughs> that thing, which thing? What, what thing are you talking about, Janet? She goes, that thing where, where people sit on the edge of their chair and they let their bladders fill up and they won't leave the room and they don't look at their phone, that thing. And I go, oh, that thing. Oh, that. And then I said to her, do you really want to know? Do you really want to know? And, and she goes, yeah, I do. And why did I ask that? Because don't coach people without permission. Are you with me? It's very tempting to coach people without permission, but don't do that. So I asked her, do you really want to know? She goes, yeah. And I said, well, I tell stories. She goes, but Eric, I tell stories. And I go, you know, Janet, you do. But there's a style of speaking that is like reporting. And there's a style of speaking that's like storytelling. One way to think of it is, is you're in a helicopter and you can tell a story from very high up or you can drop down into the detail of the story. When you're high up, you can pass over time quickly but you don't create an emotional connection with the audience. When you're down low, you can create the emotional connection. She goes, I, I don't get it. I go, all right, you know the story you told about how you ran away from home and you, you, from San Francisco and you went up to, or from LA and you went up to San Francisco and this is in the middle of the hippie movement. She's in Hate ashbury in the middle of milk and all that stuff that was happening in the 60s. She ran away from home and she told the story on stage. But I said, the thing, Janet, is, is I wanna tell the story back to you. Can I do that? She goes, yeah, please. And I go, okay. I just need to ask some questions. And I asked her a few detailed questions. And then I said, the car that you got in when you, when you left the job you were in, that car, what kind of car was it? She goes, I don't know. I don't know. It's a long time ago. I don't know. I go, okay, no problem. And I go, let me tell you the story. So, um, so I ran away from home when I was about 16 years old. And I went up to San Francisco because I heard that that's where it was happening. All the best music, all the best drugs, everything was best in San Francisco. So I went up there and I got there, had a little bit of money and I met some really amazing people. And, but you know, I then I ran out of money and I, I couldn't find work and, and, and I was like kind of couch surfing and I didn't have places to stay. And then I got into these awkward situations where I'd like go out for a meal with my friends and I wouldn't order anything because I didn't have any money. And then the worst thing would happen. At the end, one person would pick up the whole bill and I knew I could have eaten. I, I knew. And then one day, my friends had the friends that were left because you start losing friends when you live like this. And the friends that were left, they, they, they called me and they said, we got you a job. And I was so excited. They got me this incredible job and I went off to go do this job. And I got there and I went upstairs and I sat in my desk and I got the training and I hated it. It was awful. They, I, I was on the phone selling some technology that I hated. It was just, I hated it. And the, 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 it was in this little cubicle and the stale air and fluorescent lights and the wallpaper peeling off the side. And I just, I didn't even say anything to anybody. I just got up on my desk and I left. I never went back. She goes, I, I just left. I walked down the stairs and I got in my car and she goes, and then she, she, I'm telling her this story. And I, and I say, and I got in my car and she goes, Red Ford Escort. What happened? I told the story with emotion and the emotion triggered her memory. And then she said, how did you know about the peeling wallpaper? I said, I don't know, I just felt it. I was in. I was doing something that some people might call cold reading, but it's just telling a good story. I was just associated with her situation. Now, about, she got it. She really got the difference of storytelling and, and reporting the facts and about Six or eight weeks later, I was on a podcast. I was being interviewed on a podcast about storytelling. And the podcaster, you know, asked me about storytelling and I wanted to tell him this story, but I had not yet spoken to Janet and I didn't have permission. I, I don't tend to tell stories about people if I don't have permission to tell the story. So I didn't have permission to say her name. So I just talked about this person. I told the guy the story and I, everything I said to you and I came to the end of the story. I came to the end of the story and I'm, 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 I'm coming down. And I go, and I came down the stairs and I got in my car and the guy, the podcast guy, goes, Red Ford Escort. <laughs> I'm like, how do you know that? And he goes, 
Janet was on the show last week. <laughs> yeah, and she told it really well. And you know what was like fascinating about this? What's really fascinating is, is that, remember what I said before, stories are absolutely key to the way we memorize things. And, and we all know this, and we like to hear a good story, but then we don't sometimes have the skills to tell one. And it's actually not that difficult. As I say, we're gonna do a couple of cool drills tomorrow that'll really help you with this. But I really want you to remember, if you are designing a talk, and you look at the talk, and you put a pie chart together, if, the, if that talk is less than 70% stories, it's gonna be hard for you to hold the audience. Now it's different, there are different environments. There are times when you already have tremendous rapport with an audience. For example, when Vision at the end of A-Fest does a wrap up of what's going on in Mind Valley, everybody's curious about what he's talking about. He doesn't need to pepper stories in every single detail of that. He's already earned the rapport with you. But if, if you're going off to speak at some conference where you've not earned that rapport with the audience, stories give you that opportunity. Does this make sense? How many of you guys have seen Ken Robinson's TED Talk, the one on education? It is the number one watched TED Talk, or at least it was, 60 some odd million, I don't even know, it's huge. And, and it's on education. Does that strike you as the topic that's going to get the most views on TED Talks? No, why did it? Because it was clinical, it was perfect. And so I'm gonna share a formula with you that if you ever need to design a talk, and I will walk you through this in workshop tomorrow, but I'm gonna share a formula with you, and it basically works like this. If you, if we wanted to hire, say, the Rolling Stones to play at the final party, who thinks we should get the Rolling Stones for the final party? Anybody think we should, we, I think we should do it. Rolling Stones. Would they need to practice? No, they might need a wheelchair ramp, <laughs> but they will not need to practice. Why will they not need to practice? Because they are experts at their songs. Now there's a clue in this. So we tell them we want them to perform for 45 minutes. They take a look and they go, well, this song is 12 minutes, this song is seven minutes, this song is 15 minutes, and they go, it's six songs. What if we tell them they need 15 more minutes? They just play some of the songs longer or add songs. What if we tell them they have to cut 15 minutes, knock out a song? The only thing they have to memorize is five things. The five songs they're gonna do in what order they're gonna do them, that's it. Design your talks like that. Your, your stories are your songs. You know them, you live them. You should never memorize your talk. You should never write it down. Don't do that, please don't, don't. How many of you, come on, be honest. How many of you write out the talk? Stop it! <laughs> don't ever do that again. I'll show you what it looks like when you do it. I am so excited to be giving you my presentation today. <laughs> I wrote it last night and I've read it 463 times in front of the mirror. In case of a cabin depressurization, please put your oxygen mask on before, oh, fuck. No, never write your talk because then you're trying to memorize the words. But if you build a set, you just have to remember the five stories you're gonna tell. You build a set and that's it. And then you remember your stories. You don't have to memorize them. Does this make sense? Now, one more thing. I really wanna make this point for you. I was not a natural, or I was. Exactly the same for you. You may not feel like a natural, but you are. You were absolutely born to be an effective communicator, and it's inside you. It's not like golf, you don't have to learn it, it's actually in there, it just needs to be unlocked, it just needs to be released, that's it. Then there are some skills you can learn, don't get me wrong, there are skills to learn, but the first part is simply this, becoming comfortable with being you in front of an audience. And the minute you do that, the minute you do that, you will elevate yourself above 90% of the professional speakers. I just wanna come back to this. I asked you guys earlier, you've been to that conference, you've been to that one where the, there's some speaker up there and you're like, oh, I wish I was sitting on the aisle. You know what I'm talking about, right? Now I want you to think about something. That person droning on in the same voice the entire time, you know what I'm talking about, they were paid to be there. Somebody flew them, probably in business class, to be there. So how good do you need to be to beat that? <laughs> I'm telling you right now, it's not, it, you don't even have to be that, you just have to be authentic. And if you, and humans, humans have a natural attraction to authenticity, natural, and it works like this. Would you rather have an authentic enemy or an inauthentic friend? That's the way it works. 
You would much rather have an authentic enemy than an inauthentic friend. So if you can walk up on stage and deliver the truth of you, if you can deliver like Brené Brown did with the vulnerability, if you can be you, then you will create a level of stage effect that will change your entire life. You are right now one well-constructed, one well-delivered talk away from the next huge breakthrough of your life, whatever that might be. And I hope I just helped you to get one step closer. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.